Well, buenas tardes. I'm Stephen Ezel, the Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. And we appreciate your joining us today as we release a new report titled Assessing the Dominican Republic's Readiness to Play a Greater Role in Global Semiconductor and Printed Circuit Board, PCB, Value Chains. I'll introduce today's panelists. We'll turn it over to the Minister for Remarks and then roll into a presentation of report and the panel. Well, we're delighted to be joined this morning by Minister Victor Bazono Hassa. He is the Dominican Republic's Minister of Industry, Commerce, and MSMEs. He was appointed so by President Luis Abinader since 2020. He has long been a prominent leader, a political leader in the Dominican Republic. He has served as president of the Economy, Planning, and Development Committee, and was also a member of the Industry and Commerce and Treasury Committees. From 2003 to 2011, he was twice a member of the National Council of the Magistrate, receiving unanimous support from his colleagues in the chamber. Before that, he served as chief of staff at the Ministry of Infrastructure from 87 to 91. He is also the author of four books, uh, many on the transformation of the Dominican Republic economy, including Las Pasas de la Nación and Vision de Nación. Look, look forward to your remarks. After he makes his presentation, I'll go through the report, and then we'll turn it over to our panel, first hearing from Mrs. Frances Chang, who is Director of International Engagement at the U.S. CHIPS Program Office. She has spent the majority of her career in the U.S. Department of Justice, facilitating international law enforcement cooperation with jurisdictions spanning the globe from the Western Hemisphere to East Asia. She's also served appointments in the U.S. Department of State, as well as the National Economic Council and National Security Council. She has degrees from Harvard and a JD from Georgetown University. Uh, then we'll hear from Jason Marsek. He is Vice President and Senior Director of the Adrian Arst Latin American Center at the Atlanta Council, which he joined in 2013. In 2021, he established the Caribbean Initiative at the Council. He's also an adjunct professor at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs and holds degrees from John Hopkins and uh, Tufts. Uh, next, delighted to be joined by Mr. Christopher Hess. He is Vice President of Global Public Affairs for Eaton Corporation, a global intelligent power management company. Uh, he works uh, with Eaton businesses to develop their strategic positions on global regulatory, legislative, and government issues, and uh, spearheads a lot of the work on digital transformation and, and energy transition at the organization. Uh, last but not least, uh, our anchor leg is David Schild. He is Executive Director of the Printed Circuit Board Association of America, PCBAA. Previously, he was Founder and Managing Partner at Three River Strategies, and before that, a Senior Manager of Public Affairs at Raytheon Technology, Yields Degrees, uh, Undergraduate Masters from George Washington University. Uh, let me also inform our audience watching online this morning uh, that if you wish to submit questions, which we'll take at the end, you can do so via the Slido application, which is found at the bottom of the event webpage, and we'll be looking to take your questions there. Okay, with that, uh, Minister, the floor is yours, and I should note that uh, he'll be speaking Spanish, but uh, his colleague, uh, Felipe, uh, will be providing English translation. The floor is yours. Señor Steven Exel, vicepresidente de la Fundación para la Tecnología de la Información y la Innovación, quien estuvo con nosotros en República Dominicana hace un par de meses, en el saludo a los demás miembros del panel y de su equipo esta mañana. A la señora Sonia Guzmán, nuestra embajadora de República Dominicana de los, ante los Estados Unidos, y en ella saludo a la delegación de empresarios que nos acompaña en esta misión a los panelistas que han dispuesto de su tiempo para acompañarnos y compartir sus experiencias. Señores del Departamento de Estado y de Comercio del Gobierno de los Estados Unidos, muy buenos días a todos. Greetings to Mr. Steven Ezel, Vice President of ITF, who was with us in the Dominican Republic a few months ago. Mrs. Sonia Guzmán, Ambassador to the Dominican Republic in the United States, and the delegation of the private sector representatives who are accompanying us on this trip. The panelists who have been generous with their time to be with us to share their experiences and our friends from the State Department and Commerce Department of the United States. Very good morning to all. Como Ministro de Industria, Comercio y Pymes, me siento muy orgulloso de estar aquí, siendo parte de este encuentro con el que definitivamente estamos haciendo historia, materializando un hito para seguir posicionando la República Dominicana como un destino estratégico de inversión en un contexto global en que las cadenas de valor 
en todo el mundo están experimentando una rápida transformación. Este es el caso de los semiconductores, una industria global que está preparada para seguir creciendo en la próxima década, por lo que se prevé que se convierta en una industria de un billón de dólares para el 2030. Este panorama, aunado al interés y el accionar del gobierno dominicano de aprovechar esta coyuntura y de procurar que nuestro país se convierta en un destino de nearshoring para la industria mundial de semiconductores y de placas de circuitos impresos, y en particular para el ensamblaje, prueba y empaque ATP de los microchips, fue lo que nos llevó a comisionar a la Fundación para la Tecnología de la Información y la Innovación la preparación de un estudio de factibilidad sobre el potencial de República Dominicana para participar activamente en esta importante industria. As Minister of Industry, Commerce and SMEs of Dominican Republic, I am very proud to be here, being part of this event by which we are making history, a milestone to continue positioning the Dominican Republic as a strategic investment destination in a global context in which value chains around the world are undergoing rapid transformation. This is the case of semiconductors, a global industry that is poised to continue to grow in the next decade and expected to become a trillion dollar industry by 2030. This outlook, combined with the actions of the Dominican Republic government to take advantage of the situation and ensure that our country becomes a nearshore destination for the global semiconductor and printed circuit board industry, and particularly for assembly, testing, and packaging, ATP, of microchips, was what led us to commission the ITF to prepare a feasibility study on the potential of the Dominican Republic to actively participate in this industry. Un estudio que concluye con buenas noticias para nuestro país, pues queda claro que República Dominicana está bien posicionada para convertirse en un aliado estratégico de los Estados Unidos en la industria de semiconductores y en un destino seguro para la atracción de inversiones vinculadas a esta industria. Queda claro también que nuestra propuesta de valor como nación, sustentada en diversos factores, entre ellos múltiples ventajas competitivas, convierten a la República Dominicana en una alternativa confiable para realizar procesos de ensamblaje, prueba y empaque en lo que el país ya registra avances significativos. The study concludes with positive news for our country, as it, as it is clear that the Dominican Republic is positioned to become a strategic ally of the United States in the semiconductor space and a safe destination for attracting investments linked to the industry. It is also clear that our value position as a nation, based on various factors, including multiple competitive advantages, make the Dominican Republic a reliable alternative to carry out ATP processes. Esto para nosotros es de vital importancia, sobre todo si tomamos en cuenta que en América Latina, hasta ahora, solo dos países disponen de fa facilidades para la ATP, por lo que la oferta existente en la región es insuficiente para cubrir una demanda global en crecimiento. Sin lugar a dudas, esto representa una oportunidad única para promover y al mismo tiempo seguir fortaleciendo el posicionamiento que hemos logrado internacionalmente como importante plataforma industrial y logística y como un país donde el entorno empresarial es favorable para el desarrollo de los negocios y de las inversiones. Esto, gracias a que por décadas hemos disfrutado de una sólida estabilidad política, social y económica, un marco legal robusto para promover el desarrollo de sectores estratégicos, una mano de obra joven y competitiva y una gran sinergia público-privada que ha sido la clave para el éxito y los logros que hoy exhibimos y la delegación de empresarios que nos acompaña es una muestra de ello. This is of vital importance to us, especially if we take into account that in Latin America, currently, only two countries have facilities for ATP. So the existing supply chain in the region is insufficient to cover global demand and growth. Without a doubt, this represents a unique opportunity to promote and at the same time continue strengthening the positioning that we have achieved internationally as an important industrial and logistics platform as a country where the environment is favorable for the development of business and investments. This is thanks to the fact that for decades we have enjoyed solid political, social, and economic stability, a robust legal framework to promote the development of strategic sectors, a young and competitive workforce, and a great public-private synergy. 
which has been key to the success and achievements that we exhibit today and, the deleg and represented by the delegation of businessmen and women that accompany us. Si a estas bondades le sumamos el hecho de que Estados Unidos es el principal destino de nuestras exportaciones y un país con el que la República Dominicana conserva fuertes lazos económicos, sociales y culturales y con lo que compartimos los mismos valores democráticos y de libertad, resulta incuestionable que contamos con todos los requisitos necesarios para convertirnos en un player de primer nivel en la región y en un socio estratégico para este país en una búsqueda de fortalecer y hacer más resiliente la cadena global de la industria de semiconductores. If we add to these benefits the fact that the United States is the main destination for our exports and a country which the Dominican Republic maintains strong economic, social, and cultural ties and with which we share the same democratic and liberal values, it is unquestionable that we have all the necessary requirements to become a top player in the region and a strategic partner for this country in its quest to strengthen and make the global semiconductor industry chain more resilient. Señoras y señores, con este hito que alcanzamos hoy, nos convertimos en el primer país del hemisferio que cuenta con un reporte de factibilidad en semiconductores, por lo que estamos en el mejor momento para atraer esta industria hacia la República Dominicana y para esto esperamos contar con el acompañamiento de los departamentos de Estado y de Comercio de los Estados Unidos. Confío en que a partir de ahora y a lo largo de los años venideros, daremos los pasos necesarios junto al sector privado para accionar en la dirección que establecen las recomendaciones contenidas en este reporte a fin de lograr nuestra meta de posicionar a la República Dominicana como el destino del New Shoring líder en la región para atraer inversiones de empresas de ATP, especialmente las norteamericanas. Muchas gracias. Ladies and gentlemen, with this milestone that we've reached today, we become the first country in the hemisphere that has a feasibility report on semiconductors. So we're in the best moment to attract this industry to the Dominican Republic. And for this, we hope to have a support of the United States Departments of State and Commerce. I am confident that from now on and for the years to come, we will take the necessary steps together with the private sector to act in the direction established by the recommendations contained in the report in order to achieve our goal in positioning the Dominican Republic as a leading nearshoring destination in the region to attract investments from ATP companies, especially U.S. ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Well, so as I said, I'm Stephen Izal, VP Global Innovation Policy here at ITIF. If you don't know about us, uh, we've been named the world's leading science, technology, and economic policy think tank by the University of Pennsylvania Global Go-To Think Tank Index for the past three years uh, with a mission to advocate for innovation-based economic growth in countries around the world. So I want to uh, briefly provide an overview of the report we released this morning. <clears throat> Uh, first, looking uh, at the political economy of the Dominican Republic, and then looking specifically at the opportunity they have in the semiconductor ATP and printed circuit board space. Well, the Dominican Republic has grown to become Latin America's seventh largest economy. Amazingly, it has achieved a nearly 5% annual economic growth rate consistently for the past 50 years, except for COVID-19. Uh, but it has demonstrated the fastest income convergence toward the U.S. level of any Latin American nation over that period. It's attracted nearly $30 billion in foreign direct investment into the country over the past decade. And it's, uh, it's characterized by a stable political economy and business-friendly investment environments. As the International Finance Corporation has written, quote, the Dominican Republic's remarkable performance can be attributed to several factors, including implementation of sound policies, improvements in policy frameworks, a more defied, diversified export base, and the economy's structural flexibility to changing global conditions. Driving much of the economic growth in the Dominican Republic are the free zones. There are 87 of them, industrial parks, supporting 820 companies in operation. The Dominican Republic's free zones support 200,000 workers, 55% of whom are women. 
the companies produce $8 billion in exports annually and have invested $7.2 billion into the country over the past decade. 77% of products produced into DR uh, free zones flow to the United States. Uh, medical devices or instruments are the largest free zone exporter, 2.25 billion a year, followed by electronics. And much of this is enabled by DR's Law 890. Uh, this is a legal framework that allows manufacturers and exporters operating in the free zones um, exemptions from paying 100% of a wide variety of taxes, including income taxes, taxes on the transfer of industrialized goods and services, import taxes and custom duties, export re-export taxes, taxes on patents, assets or estates, uh, and then a wide variety of other taxes. As the minister noted, electronics manufacturers in the free zones have a really significant footprint. There are 25 leading global electronics manufacturers active in DR free zones. 16 of these 25 are subsidiaries of Northern American companies. Two of the most prominent are Eaton Corporation. We'll hear about them from Chris this morning, as well as Rockwell, uh, Eaton Corporation and Rockwell Automation. Uh, Rockwell is a developer of industrial automation, digital transformation uh, technologies. Uh, they produce $52 million uh, and 12, billion, 12 million units of goods uh, off the island each year. Um, in total, the electronics uh, manufacturing sector in the DR. FCEs employ 11,200, that's 6% of free zone employment, nearly 99% of those exports go to the United States, and currently circuit breakers, cellular phones, and networking gear are the primary exports. Looking at the DR's wider political economy, uh, it should be noted that the country has truly made incredible strides over the past decade in increasing uh, its governance and political economy. Uh, the World Bank provides a series of, of worldwide governance indicators looking at things like rule of law, regulatory quality, government effectiveness, political stability, et cetera. And what you can see here is that the DR scores, especially on rule of law and government effectiveness, have increased markedly over the past decade and now offer some of the strongest scores on these indicators in Latin America. In particular, this has been empowered by the DR's, quote, bureaucracy zero program, uh, bureaucracy is zero, uh, which seeks to enhance public efficiency through clear regulatory frameworks and uh, since the arrival of the president uh, has streamlined 315 procedures across 63 government institutions. Uh, in short, the DR appears to be working very hard to uh, really provide a strong uh, environment to ease of doing business in the country. Uh, the country is also blessed with an enviable uh, geographic location in the middle of the Caribbean. Uh, according to the 2019 Global Competitiveness Index, the country, quote, possesses the top in, uh, transportation infrastructure in Latin America. The DR ranks second in Latin American in, in international connectivity by air transport, eight international airports uh, serving 150 designations, 12 international airports, excuse me, <laughs> serving 150 destinations, um, and uh, ranks third in terms of maritime services and maritime connectivity. Uh, Nat del Caribe is one of Latin America's most important network access points. Uh, integrating uh, satellite uh, underground cable uh, into a, a really a sophisticated state-of-the-art uh, networking operation center. Um, in terms of uh, energy infrastructure, the country expects to generate 25% of its electricity from renewables by 2025, so it can support clean, efficient, sustainable industrial operations. It's also worked hard on its customs environments. Uh, recently, the DR introduced a program called Dispatch 24 or 24H, uh, this seeks to process cargo containers within 24 hours. Another program called Export Mas uh, allows participating companies to export without a physical inspection process and in a truly digital format. Um, so a very strong customs and logistical environment. Um, I wouldn't have confidence in the DR's ability to play in the semiconductor ATP or PCB space if I didn't think that they had a world-class regime of vocational education training institutes to train their workforce with the advanced skilled, skills needed to compete in the microelectronics space. And, and a truly, I think, globally impressive program uh, is InfoTEP. This is the Dominican Republic's National Institute of Professional Technical Training. Um, essentially, uh, it, it's got uh, uh, 245 centers around the country, uh, one connected in almost every free zone, and companies fund InfoTEP by contributing 1% of their monthly payrolls to the program. But they can use 35% of that amount to work with the InfoTEPs to design customized training programs uh, 
uh, pertinent and, and tuned to the specific workforce needs of each company. And the report is replete with examples of medical device companies, electronics manufacturers, who sat down with Inputup and designed uh, uh, education programs around uh, uh, near field communications uh, or uh, kind of advanced electronics. So very impressive. Um, in total, uh, they've trained 700,000 individuals uh, across the country. I should also note another institute of vocational training called ITLA. This is the Las Americas Institute of Technology, which started at the Las Americas Industrial Park, but it's now a technical institute of higher education, enrolling 4,500 students per quarter. Also of note is that the Dominican Republic has a very cost-effective manufacturing labor environment. Uh, manufacturing labor costs in Dominican Republic are about half Costa Rica's and even less in China's. And this matters ever more as from 2018 to 2022, labor costs adjusted for productivity rose by 24% in China, 22% in Mexico, and 18% in India. So I think the Dominican Republic offers both a cost competitive labor environment, but with the skills that you need to compete in advanced technology industries. So it'll be no surprise to you all that we're in what some analysts have called the reglobalization moment. Uh, according to the consulting firm Kearney, quote, 80% of companies across all industries are now on the path to reshore. UBS issued an investment note in November 2023, which said, quote, 71% of US companies with manufacturing in China are either in the process or planning to shift their operations to other countries. BCG report from earlier this year found that 90% of North American manufacturing executives have moved some of their production and sourcing to different countries over the last five years, or will do so in the next five. In short, the current reorganization of global supply and production chains presents nations with an opportunity to present their unique and new value propositions to companies in a global economy that's organizing in real time. And when we look at the Americas and the United States, with the passage of the $52 billion CHIPS Act, we see new plants going in from Micron, Texas Instruments, Intel, SK Hynix, Samsung. Uh, we see an industry, uh, the semiconductor industry, that $600 billion today should grow to a trillion dollar industry by the end of this decade. Hopefully, this will create new opportunities for all of us in the Americas to compete in this industry. And one reason this matters for the United States is that when we bring in imports from Asia, essentially 4% of their content is US value added. But when we bring in imports from the Latin Americas, 40% of that content starts with, with US value added. So when we are nearshoring, reshoring, friendshoring, we're moving production into a friendly geopolitical environment, it's good for all of us. Now, when we look at the semiconductor industry specifically, we see that uh, we're dealing with the world's fourth most traded product. And there are really three highest level phases of the semiconductor production chain. You start with, with R&D, with countries like India and the US very strong in R&D. Then you go into the wafer fabrication, you know, manufacturing the chip itself. And then you get to what's called ATP, assembly test and packaging. So after the wafer is developed, uh, the chips are cut from the silicon wafer, tested for performance, and packaged to protect the chip and allow their integration into finished electronic devices. But what this chart, which the censor kindly showed, is that in each phase of this production process, there are dozens of countries throughout the world who have, uh, that have companies who have developed a comparative advantage to compete in these industries. Uh, so it shows that there's tremendous global opportunity for a variety of nations to compete in semiconductor value chains. When we look at ATP specifically, uh, we see that there are, are two types of ATP companies. Um, essentially, in the semiconductor world, you have two types of firms. You have these integrated device manufacturers, companies like TI, that have the entire supply chain from the design, the manufacturing, and the ATP of the chip that they do themselves. You have other companies that are fabulous foundries. So uh, NVIDIA or Apple designs a chip, and they send it to, to, to a foundry, which, which makes it. So anyway, I want to point that out, because this is why you see IDM and OSAT as we look at the number of ATP facilities that exist around the world. But the key point that you see here is that China and Taiwan uh, dominate the global ATP footprint. In fact, we only have 65 facilities in North America, and as was mentioned, only four in Latin America that are active in ATP. Uh, this means we need to get the Americas much more deeply involved in chip ATP activity. But 
why should the Dominican Republic target this industry? Uh, the Dominican Republic, like the United States, like any other country, faces a pressing number of social and economic challenges. Why this particular industry? Well, I think there are several key reasons. First, advanced electronics industries create significant economic and employment multiplier effects. So in the United States, each $1 added to the US economy by electronics manufacturing generates $1.32 in broader economic activity. We look at the semiconductor industry in the US. For every one job it creates, 5.7 jobs are created in the downstream economy. So that would be equally true for the Dominican Republic. If you can attract this sector, you should see significant employment and economic multipliers. More subtly than that, though, semiconductor manufacturing can produce tremendous spillover and learning by doing effects across the rest of the DR's high tech economy. So you guys may know this a famous economist called Ricardo Hausman. And Hausman talks about the product space that exists for companies. And essentially what he argues is that a country's initial pattern of specialization impacts its ability to expand competitiveness in adjacent industries. So what it's saying is that your current kind of industrial profile is determinative, determinative of your ability to expand into other sectors. Why does that matter? Well, because I think the extent electronics manufacturing base that the Dominican Republic already has gives it the springboard to now get into PCB and semiconductor ATB manufacturing activity. And in turn, if it can successfully do that, then downstream it can get into other sectors like robotics or uh, biopharmaceuticals or maybe even semiconductor fabrication someday. Um, but not only does learning to manufacture semiconductors produce knowledge spillover effects on the factory floor. It also creates spillover effects in the policymaking environment. And why is that? Well, if you think about manufacturing semiconductors, this is one of the most complex engineering activities humanity undertakes. In fact, I don't know if you guys know this, but when we look at the semiconductor fab, the production lines are so finely designed that they're tied to the gravitational effects of the moon on Earth. The point is, if you want to attract this industry, then the sophistication of your policy making environment has to be every bit as nuanced, deep, and complex as the sophistication of that manufacturing factory floor. For the reality is that semiconductor companies consider as many as 500 different factors when choosing where to make internationally mobile investment decisions. In other words, nations have become price takers and companies price makers on global markets. So companies shop the world and they say, US, DR, Israel, what do you have to offer us in terms of the best infrastructure, tax policy, uh, access to skilled talent, roads, transport, et cetera. So the point is the DRs or Americas or Arizona's or a province's check marks on these 500 factors have to not only be strong in a check mark, they gotta be better than everybody else's in the world. And for countries that can master that type of policy making environment, I think that bodes very well for your broader capacity to compete in high tech industries. So in summary, what are the key conclusions of the report? The Dominican Republic offers a stable and predictable investment climate and one of the most attractive FDI environments in the Americas. It possesses an extant electronics manufacturing base that can serve as a springboard for migrating up the electronics value chain has a cost competitive manufacturing environment, strong infrastructure, and between Infotep, ITLA, and universities like Intech, it has the resources necessary to train a skilled microelectronics workforce at scale. I'll close with just highlighting a few policy recommendations from the report. Uh, we do think that the DR should be considered a leading candidate to be designated an International Technology Security and Innovation Fund, ITSE Fund recipient uh, by the US Department of State. Uh, the country uh, should really launch an awareness campaign, uh, even more strongly reaching out to global investors uh, in advanced electronics industries, highlighting the favorable investment in free zone environments. Um, it should take this report and from there develop a very specific national semiconductor value proposition and strategy. It should look to expand uh, relationships with U.S. universities and deepen availability of computer science and electrical engineering classes in the country. Uh, like states like Arizona have done, it should develop a one-stop shop for regulatory clearance and permitting that would be pertinent to semiconductor industries. Um, 
lastly, it's really great that the Dominican Republic uh, has a strong trade policy environment. It's already a member of the Information Technology Agreement, the ITA. This is a WTO plurilateral agreement that eliminates uh, tariffs on trade and hundreds of ICT products. Uh, however, we would advise the government to join the ITA too. This was an expansion of the original ITA agreed in 2015 that brought 200 more ICT products under coverage of the agreement. Actually, an ITA 3 is now under discussion, uh, so uh, we'd encourage DR representatives to get involved in that dynamic as well. Um, and, you know, you can't um, move designs of chips or designs of chip plants without the movement of data across borders. And therefore, we encourage the DR to join international initiatives like the WTO's Joint Statement Initiative that are trying to set global rules for e-commerce and digital trade of the highest standards. So with that, muchas gracias. And we'll turn it over to Francis. Good morning. Uh, my name is Frances Chang, and I am the Director of International Engagement for the Chips for America Office at the U.S. Department of Justice. I'm delighted to be here today to share with you the progress that we have made since the Chips and Science Act was signed into law in August 2022, including our vital collaboration with partners and allies to build together a more diverse, secure, and resilient semiconductor supply chain. Semiconductors are integral to America's economic and national security, but we have fallen behind in manufacturing these devices. In addition, many elements of the semiconductor supply chain are geographically concentrated, leaving them vulnerable to disruption and endangering the global economy and U.S. national security. The Bipartisan Chips and Science Act of 2022 was enacted to reverse those trends. Strategically investing in U.S. semiconductor manufacturing not only helps to ensure that the United States can continue to meet our economic and national security needs, but also helps to diversify and secure the global semiconductor supply chain. The Chips and Science Act invests $50 billion through the Department of Commerce's Chips for America Fund to revitalize the domestic semiconductor industry, protect American national and economic security, preserve U.S. leadership in the industries of the future, create good paying jobs, and build strong communities here in the United States. The fund includes $39 billion to onshore semiconductor manufacturing through an incentives program, and $11 billion to advance U.S. leadership in semiconductor research and development. Last February, Chips for America launched our first funding opportunity for chips manufacturing incentives, built, beginning the first phase of a once in a generation opportunity to create a thriving, long lasting domestic semiconductor manufacturing industry here in the United States. Roughly nine months later in December, Chips for America announced our first preliminary memorandum of terms or PMT with BAE Systems Incorporated. And just a few weeks ago, we announced our second PMT with Microchip Technology Incorporated. These announcements pertaining to our first funding opportunity underscored the core objective of the CHIPS program, advancing US economic and national security, and kicked off the next phase of implementation during which the CHIPS program will announce PMTs with companies that have made it through the program's rigorous merit review process. We will continue to make funding announcements throughout 2024. Chips for America is also currently accepting concept plans for small scale supplier funding opportunity projects with less than $300 million in capital investment. The application portal for small scale supplier concept plans will close at 6 a.m. Eastern time on February 2nd. Now the centerpiece of the CHIPS R&D program is the National Semiconductor Technology Center or the NSTC, a public-private consortium where government, industry, customers, suppliers, educational institutions, entrepreneurs, and investors will come together to innovate, connect, and solve problems. The main purpose of the NSTC is to ensure 
the United States leads the way in the next generation of semiconductors, driving innovation and speeding up the transfer of new technology to the market. The NSTC aims to fulfill the unmet needs of the sector with member services, such as access to emerging materials and process technologies, digital assets and design tools, and incubation support for startups. While manufacturing incentives for the chips from the CHIPS Act will bring semiconductor back to the, here to the United States, a robust R&D ecosystem led by the NSTC will keep it here. In October, the Department of Commerce announced that it had reached an initial agreement with a new independent nonprofit called the National Center for the Advancement of Semiconductor Technology, or NATCAST. The department expects that NATCAST will be the operator of the NSTC once formally established. And two weeks ago, NatCast announced that industry veteran Deidre Hanford will serve as the organization's first chief executive officer. So even as Chips for America continues to progress in our domestic investments in manufacturing R&D, we know that the semiconductor supply chain will continue to be global. The complexity of this tiny technology and its myriad inputs means that no country can expect to be self-sufficient when it comes to semiconductor production. Indeed, at Chips for America, we seek to work closely with allies and partners to build, together, a healthy global semiconductor ecosystem that drives innovation and is resilient to a range of disruptions, from cybersecurity threats to natural disasters to pandemics. And that is why, despite the focus on domestic investments, our office has on staff a director of international engagement, me. And I have working with me a team of seasoned international relations professionals. In the 10 months that I have served in this role to date, I have traveled to meet with foreign partners in seven economies across three continents and have engaged with many more in various bilateral and multi multilateral settings. In fact, I just returned from Costa Rica late last week where Chips for America participated in the Semiconductor Workforce Symposium held under the auspices of the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity. In our outreach and discussions with foreign partners, we have three main objectives. The first, communicate the priorities of the CHIPS for America program and seek to understand the priorities of our allies and partners in their semiconductor support programs. Two, share information on global supply and demand trends all along the semiconductor value chain. And three, cooperate with allies and partners to build a globally resilient supply chain through complementary investments. With regard to the first objective, the Chips for America program has identified our priorities in the various visions for success documents we have publicly released, available on our website, www.chips.gov. Very easy to remember. To date, we have released documents outlining our goals as pertains to commercial fabrication facilities facilities for semiconductor materials and manufacturing equipment, the National Semiconductor Technology Center, and the National Advanced Packaging Manufacturing Program. We believe that making clear our priorities and understanding what our allies and partners are doing to build out the semiconductor supply chain in their territories helps us all to avoid unhelpful races to the bottom in semiconductor public support. Regarding global demand and supply, the new semiconductor manufacturing capacity coming online in the United States, catalyzed by Chips for America incentives, will require additional capacity all along the value chain, from upstream inputs, including critical minerals, high purity chemicals and gases, to assembly, test, and packaging, as well as all of the equipment and subsystems required to manufacture these inputs in order to build a truly resilient semiconductor supply chain, there must be resilience at each segment of the chain. As we discuss with allies and partners, our program priorities and the demand and supply trends along, all along the semiconductor value chain, we are also identifying opportunities for complementary investments that will contribute to global resilience. There will be segments of the supply chain that Chips for America incentives will not reach while these same segments might hold great promise of expansion in other parts of the allied ecosystem. Given projected strong global demand for semiconductors for the foreseeable future and the complexity of the manufacturing process, 
not to mention the multitude of intermediate and final goods that incorporate semiconductors, there is ample opportunity for growth all along this extended semiconductor value chain. The importance of cooperation with our international allies and partners to bolster global resilience in the semiconductor industry cannot be overstated. Geographic, geographic diversity in the supply chain is a critical component of resilience. I applaud the efforts of our allies and partners throughout the region, including, of course, our partners in the Depart Dominican Republic, to enhance their business environment and attract private sector investments. Let me conclude by noting how crucial it is that private industry look beyond what has been and is to what could and needs to be in order to increase their supply chain resilience. And I refer to businesses on both the supply and demand side of the semiconductor industry, the companies that make the chips and their inputs, and the companies that buy and incorporate the chips into final consumer products. As much or as little as governments can do to attract private sector investments, supply chains move because customers demand it. While the severe supply chain disruptions of the COVID-19 pandemic are in the rear view, we all forget the lessons of that difficult time at our peril. With the CHIPS Act, the CHIPS for America program has been given the opportunity and indeed the directive to bring forth a more secure, diverse, and resilient semiconductor supply chain. I look forward to continuing working with our allies and partners to make that a reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Francis. Jason. Bueno, buenos, buenos días a todos. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> buenos días. Uh, I'd like to thank, go ahead and thank uh, Stephen um, and uh, ITIF for inviting me to join today, Ministro Vicino. Uh, que gusto verle otra, otra vez. Uh, and also, uh, great to share this panel uh, with you, Francis. Uh, great comments, as well as uh, uh, Chris and, and David. Look forward to your comments as well. And I also want to and acknowledge the Embajador Guzman, the Dominican Republic ambassador here in, in Washington, and, and the many members of the Dominican Republic private sector who are here as part of this uh, as part of this delegation. Uh, just yesterday um, at the Atlantic Council, where I serve as uh, Vice President and Senior Director of the Adrian Ars Latin America Center, we were delighted to host Mr. Bisono for a very fruitful discussion with key representatives from the private sector, uh, from the Dominican Republic, and also from Washington, and also followed by a public conversation, where I think many of the threads of the minister's opening comments came out yesterday and have, and have again come out come out today insofar as the dependability of the Dominican Republic as an investment destination. Uh, I'm delighted to continue our, our Caribbean, moving forward, our Caribbean work. Uh, we have a Caribbean uh, initiative uh, that I, uh, under the Adrian Arts Latin America Center that I oversee at the Atlantic Council, and, and joining this report launch. But I think the report, uh, Stephen, makes a really kindly uh, case for the Dominican Republic's potential as a hub for semiconductor and PCB uh, value chains. I assume that most people in this room have already read the report uh, or and, and, and now have the abridged version from Stephen's uh, summary. Uh, but when you've done so, you, you get a good sense. And I got a good sense when I read the report, of course, knowing the public before reading the report, of the country's economic potential and also its unique opportunity to become a major player in global supply chains. But I want to contextualize uh, my comments and the broader debate about nearshoring trends in Latin America and the Caribbean, which will give us a better idea of where actually does the Dominican Republic stand vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the region, especially as it relates to semiconductor nearshoring. First off, there's no doubt that we currently face a window of opportunity to leverage nearshoring trends in the Americas. As companies grow increasingly wary of the risks of relying on single sourcing and far-flung supply chains, Latin America and the Caribbean has the potential to become a major destination for supply chain re relocation. In particular, overall, the region's strategic location and close ties to the U.S. present cost and time-saving opportunities for businesses and consumers in the Western Hemisphere. Furthermore, when you look globally at the uncertainty that we see on the, on the world stage, Latin America and the Caribbean overall offers an opportunity for safe and secure investments. As well, the Inter-American Development Bank shows that near, nearshoring could add an annual $78 billion, $78 billion in the near and medium term and additional exports 
of goods and services in, across the region. So nearshoring is truly a massive opportunity for the region, and it's one that we are looking carefully at at the Atlantic Council. In fact, uh, just last December, we launched a nearshoring working group with former senior government officials, trade policy experts, and business leaders from across Central America, Mexico, and also including the Dominican Republic. We launched this group because I saw a real opportunity to do what we're all here trying to do, which is convert the rhetoric of nearshoring actually into, into reality. And I think as, as Francis, you noted in your comments, we also need greater resilience in our supply chains. And we can't forget, we can't forget the lessons of the COVID pandemic because I will tell you something, there will be future disruptions to the supply chains. And so we need that resilience built into our supply chains to protect against uh, further disruptions that we will uh, see at some point in the future. One thing that became clear from our first meeting of the Nearshoring Working Group, and the group was actually announced uh, uh, six months earlier with an event with Senator uh, Cassidy and Senator Bennett, who are uh, uh, who, who are leads on the on the Americas Act. But one thing that became clear is that the nearshoring potential of Latin American Caribbean countries varies. It varies by region. It varies by country. It varies within the country. It varies by sector. Uh, as some countries stand more ready than others to attract nearshoring investment. It's not kind of writ large around the region. If we look at the latest FDI numbers we can already start seeing which countries are already catching the interest of investors. Prominent among, prominence among them is the Dominican Republic, where FDI has seen a year-on-year -year increase of 36% and 18% between 2020 and 2022, making the country the largest recipient of FDI in Central America and the Caribbean. For too long, I think investors, experts, and global audiences have thought of the Dominican Republic mostly as a vacation spot. The majestic beaches of Punta Cana, uh, the nightlife in Santo Domingo, uh, and of course, the cradle of reggaeton is what often comes to mind when people think about the Dominican Republic. Furthermore, its strategic yet natural disaster prone location, as well as the instability in its neighboring country resulting in irregular migration flows have been on the agenda perhaps raising concerns among some about the nation's advancement as a nearshoring hub. The Dominican Republic, however, is forcing the world to promptly reconsider these notions. The country has seen unparalleled economic growth over the past 50 years, and it set itself up strategically in the global stage. Not only is the Dominican Republic a hub for commerce, it's also set to host the next annual meeting of the Inter-American Development Bank, the preeminent uh, development institution in the Americas, uh, in early March, where I will be delighted to be joining uh, that meeting in the, in the Dominican Republic. The, as well, the Sixth Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas ministerial meetings will be held in the Dominican Republic in March. And then, of course, looking at 2025, the 10th Summit of the Americas, will also be held in the Dominican Republic, so all meetings in which myself and the Atlantic Council will be participating. Moreover, the Dominican Republic has demonstrated its commitment to reducing systemic corruption in part via their collaboration with USAID and the Commercial Law Development Program within the U.S. Department of Commerce. Together, the Dominican and U.S. governments have rolled out programs to train public procurement staff and also shape the legislative reform agenda to increase transparency, accountability, and also inclusivity in the procurement process. President Abinader himself has been recognized for his commitment and actions to improve transparency throughout the procurement processes. The Dominican Republic, in addition to that, has also become a champion of democratic stability. It's one of the member countries of the Alliance for Development and Democracy, uh, one of four countries, and will actually be hosting uh, next month, Minister, the next meeting uh, of, the, of the ADD. Um, it's, it's also cultivating a reputation as an optimal destination for foreign investment. Uh, as, as referenced, the Dominican Republic is a member of the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity that was rolled out uh, here in Washington in November, and where we at the Atlantic Council were pleased to host the welcome dinner for the leader summit of the of the APP, AP, sorry, AP, AP, EP, the APEP. It's also no surprise that the Dominican Republic has done a remarkable job in attracting investment in medical equipment and electronics, and as a leader in medical exports 
in the whole region. So it's, uh, it's, it's export potential and high services, high value added products has already been proven. As well, the Dominican Republic's political stability, the existence of numerous free trade zones, uh, Stephen mentioned the, those 87 zones at the beginning, and also a cost competitive labor force are some of the crucial factors also identified that in this report that it made the DR a successful case study in attracting new in investment. The country's deep commercial ties with the rest of the Central America and the U.S. through CAFTA DR further accentuates this leverage. Once the capital of the West Indies, the first permanent establishment of the New World, the Dominican Republic has an opportunity to once more be the sailing point for a brand new world of innovation. This, in many ways, is and can be the decade of the Dominican Republic. Tying it back to semiconductors, this set of factors are also the ones that make the DR stand out in the competition to attract this type of investment. Attracting semiconductor investment, of course, is an ambitious bet, but I think it's also one where the Dominican Republic doesn't operate in a vacuum. Other countries in the region will also try and continue to try to attract semiconductor manufacturers. This report correctly identifies human capital oftentimes as a main roadblock to invest, to attract this type of investment. And in my opinion, the capacity to enhance the skills of workers will potentially be the defining differentiating factor in the competition to attract semiconductor investment. As Stephen noted, the Dominican Republic has made important strides in education, educating its workforce. Our nearshore and working group members also looking regionally have identified a uh, shortage of skilled labor as a cross cutting challenge across the region. So all the more important, the education strides uh, that have been taken and continue be, to be taken and the need for continued focus on those strides moving forward in the Dominican Republic. With semiconductor manufacturing also being so specialized, whether in PCB or ATP plants, it's continued to ensure there's minimal gap, there always will be some gap, but that there's minimal gap between what academic institutions are offering and what businesses are demanding for their labor force. An important tool that has remained historically underutilized across the region is the building out of vocational education programs or technical education. Vocational programs provide the ability to respond fast and also provide flexibility to labor market needs and are proven to have high graduation rates, rates as well as labor market outcomes across the region writ large. Also, generally speaking, across the Latin American Caribbean region, there's been an underinvestment in these programs and also a trailing of OECD counterparts. So again, important that the Dominican Republic's continued focus on, on education as it moves forward. In summary, um, I think this is a, a well done report. I think that the opportunities are profound that exist in the Dominican Republic, not just the semiconductor industry, but when you look writ large at the near showing trends in the region, you look at the democratic stability in the Dominican Republic, of course, there'll be uh, presidential uh, elections in, in, in May. And when you look at the historically uh, close ties between the Dominican Republic and the US that have only continued to grow over the years. So, I'm sure that the report being launched today, backed by the presence, the important presence of Mr. Bisono and other fellow panelists, is a first step uh, and a continued step for the Dominican Republic to be among the main beneficiaries of semiconductor nearshoring. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. That was great. Let me remind our online audience that if you have any questions, please submit them via the Slido app. On the web page, Chris, floor yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning uh, representing a company that has manufactured in the Dominican Republic for over 40 years. So my role is to give you a little perspective about how that works for Eaton and how that could work in the future for expansion and, and investment for other industries. I'm Chris Hess. I am the Vice President of Global Public Affairs for Eaton. In my role, I collaborate with all of our businesses and functions to engage with governments around the world on many different initiatives. In the past couple of years, I've been flying all over the world, talking to governments about how um, we can work together to make investments for mutual interests. So for Eaton, we are an intelligent power management company. We have been in existence for over 100 years. We have specialized in the management of electrical and mechanical power. 
recently, in the last decade, we're seeing the convergence of electrical electrification into the mechanical vehicle and so forth. So we are on the cutting edge of providing the solutions that enable the energy transition and digitalization. But also we have 100 years in the automotive and truck sector where we manage power systems on these vehicles and they're becoming more and more electrified. We're seeing increasing demands for our products. So when we discuss you know, about investing capital in expansion and where we want to operate, um, you know, we, we have uh, many different criteria that we're trying to satisfy. I've been at Eaton for 18 years, and it's a very exciting time for us. We've invested over a billion dollars around the globe in the last 18 months in ourselves to meet the demand of our customers. And Dominican Republic pay, plays such a significant role in delivering the solutions that our customers demand in North America and throughout uh, Latin America. Um, it has been you know, a fantastic opportunity for me to work with my colleagues there and other jurisdictions where we operate. They're just wonderful, skilled people that, that are there to help improve their own lives. And when we engage around the world, we're looking to improve the lives of our employees, but also the communities in which we operate. So for us, we're looking for collaboration. So you need that skilled workforce, workforce availability. We know that's a challenge around the world. We look for logistics. How close are you to our customers? How is the supply chain? How can we have, you know, basically the ability to be where we need to be uh, and, and be there, right? Um, and, and the last one is a framework of, of government operation that is collaborative a framework that is efficient for investment in capital. And Dominican Republic checks all these boxes. Uh, and I could tell you as someone who's, you, know, you were saying seven countries and so forth, I, I might've been in a dozen. Um, and you know, it's, it's right up there in the global competition. And it is indeed a global competition because as we're trying to reshore and we're, we're operating in this new geopolitical environment, <laughs> We need to be, we need resiliency in our operations, but we also need resiliency in the supply chain. So we're on a constant hunt and a constant endeavor to figure out where to do this most efficiently. Rationalize what we're doing today. Do we keep doing that? And then where do we invest new to make and to innovate so that we can deliver solutions that help us um, realize this energy transition away from fossil fuels and into more renewable types of energy production. Eaton's products manage power from the grid to the substation into buildings like this. We're probably in the basement. We are in the capital. Um, we are in mission critical uh, operations such as hospitals and data centers and military installations. Um, our mobility business is in every truck and car that drives virtually around the world. We're also in an aerospace business that uh, does uh, actuation and um, motion control and fuel management. And we're almost in every aircraft that flies. So when we go to governments and talk about Eaton, we're not just talking about one operation. We're talking about Eaton because we're talking about the opportunities to grow with the jurisdictions in which we're going to invest collaborate so that we can both be successful and meet our mutual goals. We find this in the Dominican Republic for us. Um, when I talk to my colleagues that are there on a daily basis, you know, obviously there are challenges that we're all facing, but they do, they do know that the government of the Dominican Republic is there working and trying to, to come up with innovative ways to, to engage and solve these issues. Um, I, I could speak about Eaton for half an hour, so I thought I had seven or eight minutes, but perhaps I could maybe save some time for our discussion where you may have some more specific questions for me. So I'll uh, th thank you and appreciate uh, looking forward to that Q&A. Great. Thank you, Chris. David? Thanks for the opportunity to be here this morning, and thanks to Stephen and ITIF for this important report and uh, for all of you for being here today. Uh, I'm going to come at this with a slightly different perspective, talk a little bit about 
uh, how we got here, uh, where we're going, and sort of the nature of the problem. And uh, there we go. Okay. Um, the discussion today about reshoring, nearshoring, um, and building secure and resilient microelectronics supply chains is very important because over the last 30 years, we've essentially established a reliance on one part of the world for all of these technologies. And we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, and much more recently, um, just in the last few weeks, how supply chain disruptions, uh, natural and man-made, can impact customers, can impact our ability to deliver goods and services, and of course, impact our national security. So that's why today's discussion is so important. I want to talk a little bit about the broader technology set, because this truly is a microelectronics ecosystem. There is a tremendous focus on semiconductors, uh, and the CHIPS program is a tremendous investment in that process. Uh, but as we like to say at the Printed Circuit Board Association of America, chips don't float. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, this is perhaps um, the graphic that uh, best illustrates that, right? Semiconductors, which have sort of captured the imagination, uh, and a lot of credit to my friends at Intel and TSMC for doing a tremendous job in the public's policy space on that front, um, are simply part of a broader microelectronics ecosystem. Everything that uh, is powered by electricity in this room, everything from F-150s to F-35s, is going to run on a microelectronics stack. In addition to a semiconductor, an IC substrate, as well as a printed circuit board, all of which require complex features and development, engineering, and production, are essential to make everything run. If we simply stop at semiconductor manufacturing and having the conversation about that technology alone, we won't build secure and resilient supply chains. So we're proud to represent uh, American manufacturers of printed circuit boards, integrated circuit substrates, as well as the raw materials like woven glass and copper that make these technologies possible. What we have seen over 30 years is not simply that semiconductors have gone overseas, right, along with it, research and development and the IP that goes with that, but that these other parts of the ecosystem have largely gone overseas as well. That's why uh, the Chips and Science Act was so important. And you see now that private money is following public action, which is why it's so great that the Dominican Republic is taking this initiative. It's good to see friends, partners, and allies taking these initiatives because the $52 billion that's being offered by the CHIPS Act has, by some estimates, generated almost $450 billion in private investment. Where the government goes, often the private sector will follow because they see strength and they see a demand signal that benefits their investment. Um, when we talk about the rest of the ecosystem, there are also indications that government takes this seriously. In March of 2022, President Biden announced under the Defense Production Act that printed circuit boards and integrated circuit substrates would be designated a national security technology. That frees up the US government to make faster and quicker investments. Indeed, in the last 60 days, the Pentagon has spent almost $85 million to invest in ultra high density inter interconnects, organic IC substrates, and cutting edge printed circuit boards in states like New York, in states like New Hampshire, in states like Michigan. And these are critical investments for the rest of the supply chain. Um, we think that similar investments beyond semiconductors into chips, uh, or excuse me, into IC substrates and into printed circuit boards are critically important. We say chips don't float because we don't want to create an ecosystem. We don't want to create what we are calling a secure and resilient supply chain where we're simply going back and forth across the Pacific Ocean to produce the components that we need for the end use electronics that are in our everyday lives and are also in critical infrastructure and national security applications. What's happened over the last 30 years? Basically, we have taken most of microelectronics production and moved it to one region of the world, and that's Asia. About 90% right now of the microelectronics supply chain is in Asia. Uh, when we talk about PCBs and IC substrates, obviously there's a tremendous dependence on countries like Taiwan. Uh, there is increasing work in other parts of Asia, but when we talk about printed circuit boards specifically, 90% of that market is in Asia and 56% of that market is currently in mainland China. That is an unnecessary and some would say risky foreign dependency. And so what we're hoping to build is a secure and resilient supply chain that is more diverse, that is sourced all over the world, inc including, of course, the United States, um, and brings us back into a balanced portfolio. When I talk to the heads of supply chain, when I talk to the heads of purchasing, people want to move to a more secure and resilient supply chain. They want to have a diversity of sourcing. The challenge is obviously economic. 
Price is what drove the market to where it is today. And government action and government subsidies, actions like the Chips and Science Act, will hopefully bring us back into balance and bring us back into a healthier spot. I should also emphasize that when we see the movement of manufacturing, we're losing something else that's very critical. We're losing knowledge because so often research and development is co-located with production. And so when someone says, well, we're going to move a factory overseas, there's the obvious immediate jobs impact, the obvious local economic impact that translates the United States to a political impact. But in a very real sense, we're losing the know-how. We're losing the skill set. We're losing the ability to generate these things. And we're losing the IP, which is so valuable and such a necessary commodity for our economic future. So it's not simply moving back factories. It's moving back workforces. It's moving back the ability to invent the future, which we think should be again, part of a more secure, robust, and balanced portfolio. So I appreciate the chance to be here today to add some perspective on the technology set that we're talking about specifically uh, to extend the conversation beyond semiconductors and talk about the importance of these sorts of initiatives. And I look forward to the rest of the discussion. All right. Well, thanks, David, and to our panelists. I we got about 15 minutes, so I want to welcome any questions we might have from our audience this morning. And while you are thinking about your questions, and we do encourage, encourage audience participation, but we do have a question uh, online, um, which may be all combined with a question I had on my own. Uh, but the, the online question is, do you consider the potential for a center of centers for the region to leverage over replicating and duplicating for a regional value proposition, which I guess maybe what that question is asking is, you know, how how can the countries in, in the Caribbean work, work collaboratively uh, to collectively increase their, their competitiveness to support uh, an advanced microelectronics industry? And Jason, maybe uh, you, you could maybe comment on you got you, you got the nearshoring group working and and you know have, and this exists in the U.S. as well, managing the the the, the, the competition versus collaboration question. Well, uh, thanks, thanks, Stephen, and uh, I think that's an important question. I think when you when you look at, at competition versus collaboration, I think first off, important to look at, as I mentioned briefly in my opening comments, the Dominican Republic's role as part of DR CAFTA, right? And and, D, and DR CAFTA is the the free trade agreement that includes a number of a number of Central American countries. Uh, but as well, when you look, and I think Stephen, you mentioned this in the report as well. You also the the the, the number of of, of agreement, commercial agreements that the Dominican Republic has writ large around the world, right? The Dominican Republic's relation um, uh, agreement with Europe, for example, right, uh, and and other other others globally. And so I think there is when you look at the, at the 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 space of the Dominican Republic, a, a country located in the Caribbean, but part of the uh, trade agreement that includes uh, Central America. There is an, an opportunity to look at how to better leverage some of the um, uh, so the, the, the the sourcing across, maybe across the, uh, the the trade agreement. But it really depends on whether there is actually the op same opportunities in every country. And I, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, nearshoring really depends on the individual country, the individual sector, and even regions within it within the the, the country. So while there there could be an opportunity to uh, better kind of co-locate uh, nearshoring writ large uh, with with neighbors. Uh, it partly depends on the trade agreements that are already in place, and also depends partly on the value added, the comparative advantage that other neighbors that neighbors would have, or uh, or trade partners would have vis-a-vis -vis the Dominican Republic. And so I think that's something interesting to to look at. But I, I do want to reinforce as well the importance of again the the geographic location of the Dominican Republic, right? And and, and when we talked about uh, the supply chain resilience throughout these conversation, the Dominican Republic. Um, when we will see further disruption of the supply chain, uh, the proximity to the United States uh, makes it so so fundamental for uh, the uh, some some of the the nearshoring uh, trends that are that are that are seen, but also the potential to avoid disruptions in, in the uh, in the supply chain. So um, I think that 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 geographic proximity. Uh, is something to continue to lean it, lean in on, and an opportunity to further enhance the, uh, the, the 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 future of where the semiconductor industry can go. Great. Any other reflections? I, I can add to that. In in um, our operations, we actually leverage Dominican Republic with Puerto Rico, pr pr close proximity U.S. territory with Dominican Republic. We manufacture components 
that are used in finishing products in Puerto Rico and then delivered to be incorporated into larger power, power management systems. So we've been doing that for decades and, and it's worked quite well. It's leveraging the capabilities of each jurisdiction and making sure that we're delivering on the promise to our customers. So I think living and breathing, we've got, you know, 5,500 employees there in the uh, Dominican Republic and another over 2,000 in Puerto Rico. And they're working together to deliver the 30% of the power management market for, for uh, North America. So it's, um, it's quite a story. And uh, it's uh, amazing to see them collaborate and work together to, to make sure we get done. And we're actually investing more in Dominican Republic because of the increasing demand for, for those same products. We will do the same in Puerto Rico, I'm sure, eventually. But the, the, the actual capabilities there complement each other. We, we opened a design center in Dominican Republic, Santo Domingo, where they're able to um, modify, engineer, and innovate uh, our circuit protection devices in Hanai. And we're able to um, deliver the specifications of our customers. So either it could be the size or it could be the scope or, or the capabilities of that. And they're, they're all using electronics. So from that perspective, while we're not the you know, circuit board manufacturer, we are using electronics. So it is an adjacency that, that can be leveraged. The ecosystems there are robust and it's it does have the ecosystem of a manufacturing powerhouse so we're um you know we're delighted to be able to, to talk about that and i got a chance to visit your design center i understand that uh the dr team won an international competition to have that design center specifically hosted in, in the dr yes well we compete for everything at eaton so our businesses need to put forth uh, the plan and dominican republic won so um, first, if it's kind for us, and it's, uh, it's been going well so far. So we, I think we have 70 associates there. Good collaboration with the universities and um, co-ops and then jobs. And that will only grow as, as our capabilities grow. Great. Question in the back, if you would just identify yourself. Yep. Carlos Flaquer um, from the Dominican Republic. Uh, maybe a question that uh, is more focused for uh, Ms. Chang. Um, or two questions. Are related one to the other. the The first one is, in your purview, when, how soon, um, would you say that we would start seeing the impact of the Chips Act, um, and how soon do you think that these investments that are ongoing right now would impact and shift some of the existing trends and see more of those um, being here in the in the U.S. and in the region. And second, I have had the chance to review the CHIPS Act, but I still have the doubt that, and I know it's more focused on national uh, or you know within the U.S. investments, but if a company is interested in investing some of their production or you know the ATP component of them outside of the U.S., would they still be able to... Um, um, to be able to to tap into the to the fund the the available funds of the chips act yep that's it thank you thank you for those questions i'll take the second one first um it, so um the chips and science act for the commerce department's 39 billion dollars of um, manufacturing incentives it's very clear that we can only use those incentives to uh incentivize facilities built in the united states so we obviously understand that companies build facilities all over the world, and we think that is great. Uh, we want, again, those diverse supply chains. But insofar as CHIPS incentives are concerned, we can only support facilities being built in the United States. Um, as to your first question, I think um, David here mentioned, you know, the we already seeing impact of the CHIPS Act. Um, while we, you know, have made our two, first two preliminary memorandum of terms with the two companies and we're still going through due diligence before we um, um, uh, start um, having the money go out the door, companies have already started to shift. Um, and we have seen, you know, companies express interest in coming to the United States and have started to have, you know, shovels in the ground building facilities. And that is not just the, the big fabs. It's the suppliers to those fabs, the, what I mentioned in terms of chemical suppliers, um, uh, critical components, 
That's because their customers, the big fabs, are, are coming here. And the customers for their product are saying, I need you close by. I'm going to be having all of this, um, uh, uh, this capacity coming on board. And I need you nearby so that I can you know, uh, have access to those critical components. So um, it's, a, it's a tremendously exciting time. I think we say here uh, in our office, you know, $39 billion, that sounds like a lot. Well, I mean, for those of you who you know, started to read about it, and, and I'm still learning as well, it's not much money at all when we're talking about the semiconductor industry. So it is the idea that you know, there is this, this, this drive, this excitement to say, yes, you know, the United States is, is, is focused on you know, um, creating this resilient supply chain, this resilience. Um, you know, and I think that is, that is the, the inspiring part of, of, of the, uh, the law. The money, it sounds like a lot to you and me, um, but you know, when we're thinking about it, it's really just a fraction of what's needed. But even so, um, private companies have, have seized to this, you know, this idea that yes, you know, we do need to invest in resilience because uh, <laughs> what we all experienced in the COVID-19 pandemic, and if you're parents of young children like I am, you know, that was especially difficult, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's not something I think we, we want to endure again. You know, there was tremendous damage to so many economies with all over the world. So I, I think we are already seeing the effects of the act um, and we will continue um, you know, as, as we proceed on, on the program side in terms of um, providing those incentives to companies. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Stephen Puig, <clears throat> also from the Dominican Republic and from the Ad Business Council. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the panelists, and also uh, thank you, Stephen. Congratulations on putting together this summary of uh, what the DR could be and is presently in terms of uh, potential chips production. Um, the question I had is, how do we go uh, to the next step? How do we get in front of companies that are in the supply chain that you were just mentioning? Uh, how do we get in front of uh, potential investors that might have part of their operations in the DR? What suggestions do you have? Uh, what would be the most effective at this point, given that uh, other countries are also focusing on this? What's what's the way forward? Anybody want to take that, or is that for me? <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to Go jump Jason. in there, Stephen. Um, uh, you know, I think I think maybe one one suggestion would be to look at where where the potential investors of the Dominican Republic are located. You know, here across the United States, uh, and and frankly, to, to do a roadshow. Uh, and uh, it's great to have these kind of, kind of conversations in Washington. Of course, we're being live streamed, um, and of course, uh, you know, Francis and others. You know, the importance of the U.S. government is, is critical for, as, as as noted, you know. Private investment follows kind of follows the uh, the the trend lines that that the government puts out there, but that's also I think critical to look at exactly you know uh, go to different cities across across the U.S. and and sit down and take this report and have these conversations uh, with potential investors uh, that might might already might still think about the Dominican Republic on you know beaches and, and reggaeton and and show the uh, the opportunities of investment that exists uh, in the in the country right. And I think also on that point, you know, the reality when we look specifically at the semiconductor ATP sector is that nine of the 10 largest manufacturers are, are located in Asia. Uh, now we talked about the strength that the DR has in electronics manufacturing. I think it's interesting that, as I said, uh, of the 25 that are there, 16 of the 25 are subs to North America. So I think the DR is really going to have to raise the, the, the awareness of its, of its profile in, in Asia. That's one reason why one of the report's recommendations uh, is not only this kind of, a, of launching an awareness campaign, but to advise the, the, the DR colleagues to spend more time at conferences like Semicon Southeast Asia, Semicon Korea, uh, even the Conference on Science and Technology for Integrated Circuits in, in China. Uh, I think um, you know part of this has got to be deepening your ties with, uh, with Asian partners. And actually, it leads me to a question I wanted to ask David, um, which is related. Um, and, and the same would go for PCB as well, because you said 56% are, are uh, uh, the production is now in, in China. But as as we look to shift that global footprint, what will be some of the key uh, uh, characteristics that companies will need to put forward to, to prove that they offer a competitive environment for PCB manufacturing specifically? We face the same workforce challenge that everybody else is talking about. Um, you know, the old the industry is older; it's graying. 
and we do not have a sufficient pipeline. So when you talk more broadly about the workforce challenge, I think that falls across the entire spectrum. And so any company that's looking to open PCB manufacturing facilities is going to wonder how they're going to populate those sites and how they're going to have a continuity over not just years, but decades of a workforce that has the technical capabilities. You know, we're going to have to confront this in the United States. We're putting money forth to build facilities. Uh, but the workforce challenge is one that's particularly vexing, and I know the administration is tackling it aggressively. Our industry is developing trade programs, is working with colleges and universities to try to produce the next generation. So I think any nation that wants to attract this sort of business has to look to workforce as a key component. I think, Stephen, to extend your question um you know hopefully for for your country uh, that this represents a starting point that as i said you can take forward and, and build like a specific semiconductor competitive strategy uh, uh certainly the uh the income tax environment that you offer for the free zones is, is very attractive is very competitive i think a reality that you're going to have to confront like any country uh, seeking to attract investment in this industry is that there's a tremendous amount of global money from government sloshing around. We talked about the 39 billion from the United States, but of course the Europeans have their own Chips Act of, of uh, 39 billion dollars. Um, I'll shortly be coming out with a report on India's potential to compete in this sector, and uh, they are offering 70 percent of the money up front, uh, at least on the first couple of people that do an ATP facility there. Um, uh, you know, other countries like you know Taiwan. Korea now have some semiconductor competitive strategies. So I think it will be something for the Dominican Republic government to think about. Uh, you're probably going to encounter companies that are going to say, what's the match you're going to give me to put a, put a facility here? And um, there, I think we'll need to demonstrate the attractiveness of the income tax scenario you have as they factor in the 10-year TCO evaluation of their investment opportunities. Let me, let's see, we're almost, we, well, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Yes, please. A few minutes? Yes, Thank please. you. Good morning. Uh, just a minute to, or Eva Campo from Campostela Research and Consulting, just a few minutes to share the uh, enthusiasm from, from uh, Ms. Wang. Thank you, because uh, I, 20 years ago, I saw the semiconductor industry being dismantled from this country. I was at grad school, and my field is semiconductors with the Air Force and with the Army and with the uh, Navy, Na Navy labs. And I have to say some communities never quite recovered from it. Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania being, being one of them. So this is really exciting. Now, the other question I have is, uh, if we, in, in fact, the, the, to uh, Minister Bisono, and if that's OK, I'm going to address him in Spanish. Excelencia, me preguntaba si su gobierno tendría en previsto algún tipo de política en ciencia abierta, pero más específicamente en política de datos en cuanto a fabricación. Research data, data for fabrication, for manufacturing, for semiconductors, that clearly is going to define the new wave of manufacturing. Thank you. Sí. Eh, primero agradezco la pregunta y aprovecho para agradecer también el, la actividad del día de hoy, principalmente a los panelistas. Y sí, el, el gobierno está abierto totalmente a cualquier tipo de iniciativa que tengamos que expandir en lo que tenemos hoy día, pero tenemos grandes aliados en la República Dominicana y por eso aquí la presencia de los eh, empresarios, por ejemplo. Con nosotros está la presidenta de EDUCA, que es la parte de educación privada, en República Dominicana que tutela y acompaña la parte de educación en la República Dominicana pública, donde dedicamos un 4% del PIB eh, y estamos en, en pleno desarrollo. Ya David eh, en su informe hablaba de los diferentes tipos de, de universidades e institutos tecnológicos que acompañamos a las necesidades de recursos humanos que tenemos y estamos permanentemente programándonos para poder competir y dar respuesta a las necesidades que, 
que tenemos eh, en, en esta inversión que estamos buscando. Y, y por favor, eh, quizá María Gualesca pueda decir algo más. Just really quickly, um, the minister is it says that the Dominican government is open to any any strategy that will help us move forward in this um, sector in this new world, and um, that we're um, accompanied by um, a very sophisticated um, group of private sector representatives, in which Maria Walesca, who will take the floor, is um, a representative of an organization that um, focuses on education and workforce development. Thank you. Um In the Dominican Republic, we already have in place uh, innovation strategy uh, together with the digital strategy. And as a part of those strategies, we have been considered all the data policies that we need uh, to take in place, not only for the digital environment, but certainly uh, for the steps that we need to conduct in terms of the workforce and the skills that we need to work with the different entities, the university, and also the entities that are focused in the development of the skills in the technical programs. If we want to expand in this matter, uh, of course, we can talk a little bit more when we finish. And the report goes more into depth on a number of those institutions, programs like innovation policies that the DR has in place. Well, we're about a time. Let me just ask if any of the panelists would like to make a closing remark. It's, it's not required, but uh, if, if anybody wants to leave with, with a closing thought, we we'll welcome it. All right. Well, in that case, allow me to say uh, that uh, we will have a Spanish language translation of this report out next week. We'll uh, be sure that that's extended to all of you. Video of this event will be online this afternoon. Um, and I want to thank um, the Dominican uh, Republic uh, Government Ministry of Commerce for the opportunity to collaborate uh, on this project. I want to thank you all for being here today. And I want to thank our excellent panel, including Minister Bozono, uh, for your remarks. Thank you all very much. Good day.